Thank you. Let me talk for a minute and see if the microphone is right. Are we okay on volume? Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's an intimidating topic. It suggests that, that one can uh, look at a bunch of different concepts and, and link them. Now, I've put a question mark over here between justice and peace in order to suggest that I think it's something to be thought about and talked about, about how those relate. Uh, do you have to have both, in what order? Uh, I would comment, for example, that at this particular moment, Zimbabwe is peaceful, precisely because the injustice remains in place. And when it comes time to do justice, it will not be peaceful. Uh, but those in green are the four terms that end my topic. Justice and peace, business and leadership, sort of suggest that they might flow that way. Well, what might link those? What would a member of a business school think might link those? Well, here's my answer. Prosperity. Now, that's not the only link. Before I'm done today, I'm going to suggest that people in business can also directly model justice and peace. And indeed, I think they should. But I'm going to argue that the fundamental link that business offers is that it provides people sufficiency. And while one could argue that in several ways, I'll just say this. It's my observation that men and women are much more able and willing to be concerned about justice and fairness for others and peacefulness when they have enough to eat. And that when we are doing without ourselves, it is much easier to be willing to take advantage of others or to even wage war on others. So. Now I'm going to try to break apart that middle you know, what exactly, where does prosperity come from, for example? Uh, earlier this week, that's October 4th. What is that? Tuesday, Sunday. Earlier this week, Washington Post carries Mr. Samuelson's weekly commentary about economics. This particular column had the title, Economic Magicians Wanted. Uh, here's the opening paragraph. Fairly standard stuff that reminds us that our economy is growing, but not nearly as rapidly as we would like. Some concern about whether or not it will ever return to the sort of growth we would like to see. And then in this next paragraph, notes that that uh, one of the economists over at the Cato Institute has asked several different folks to offer proposals. Caught my attention because uh, you students, do you know James Dean, your classmate? The one who's doing an internship right now in Washington at the Cato Institute? I had visited with him earlier, a couple days ago. Uh, this particular uh, individual particular economist has published the results in a book. You can look it up. You can get it as an e-book if you wish. Samuelson goes ahead to say, what we learn from this small sampling is that there's no consensus among economists about how to increase economic growth. Aside from standard platitudes, better schools, wouldn't that be a great idea? What economists advocate typically reflects their ideological leanings and practical backgrounds. This does not mean there's nothing we can do, or that some policies are not better or worse than others. But these decisions and distinctions mostly embody personal experiences and so on. Almost everyone would like for the economy to grow. It's going to require patience. There's no magic wand. So growth. 
Where does that prosperity come from? Sometimes, when I talk to folks and listen to, I mean, this is the silly season. People are running for president. Uh, I've lost track of how many are running for president. And, and they are willing to say silly things in order to attract attention. It's, re it's really fascinating. It would be a great time to be a political scientist. I am not, but it would be a wonderful time to be a political scientist. We will be studying Mr. Trump for decades, I believe. <laughs> Uh, where does that come from? Well, anyway, when I, when I listen to commentators and talk to students and others sometimes, I get the impression that we think this is where it comes from. That if the whole world would just adopt US-style democracy, that would produce free markets, and free markets would make us prosperous. I, I don't think so. The way I read the evidence, and I'm jumping ahead of a bunch of evidence I'm going to flash across the screen in front of you, but the way I read the evidence looks more like this. Now that's more complicated, and it uses some terms that are going to need special definition because they're not familiar with you. Let me talk about a couple of them with you. This model suggests that over here on the left, the rule of law is absolutely essential and that that requires a strong government. Not necessarily a large government, and mostly not an intrusive government, but a strong government. A strong government that guarantees, among other things, property rights. One of the mysteries of the failure of capitalism in much of the world is the following. You can go into the slums of Brazil. You can go into parts of Southern Africa. And people have stuff. They just can't use it the way someone here would to start a business. Now, the difference is that people here have clear title. And they can go to a bank and pull some of the excess value out of that resource and use it to improve the farm, or the factory, or the house. And if they can't find somebody who'll loan them that money in Lubbock, they can go to Albuquerque, or Oklahoma City, or St. Louis, or New York City. They have the privilege of being in a large market. And everywhere they go, that title will still work. Everybody who looks at their offer can be confident that if you tell me you own this, you do. And if you put this up in pledge for a loan, I'll have a lien on it. The people in Brazil don't have clear title to the land where they're living. They're squatters. They may have built a fine house. Do they have title to it? They do not. The poor people of the developing world have more, have more value in the stuff they have than all of the aid that has ever been sent to them. They don't have clear title to it. They can't draw capital out of it. So that's the reason for putting these two things at the left. And those provide what I've called and what the scholars in this field, uh, this is me reporting on other people's research rather than reporting on my own, that gives them what's called economic freedom which isn't the same as political freedom. Economic freedom means that I can buy and sell. That this stuff I claim to own, if I wanted to sell it to Tracy, I could. I have the freedom to do it. There may be some regulations about how he and I do business, but no one's going to step in unless there's really something odd going on. No one's going to step in and keep me from selling something that he's willing to buy at a price we have agreed to. So that, that ability to function in an economy is what we mean by, uh, by uh, economic freedom. That leads to prosperity, especially if you get to do it in a large market. I do not know whether the Trans-Pacific deal is a good one or not. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we will get to hear hundreds of people argue about that. 
And a number of them will dig through the details in a way that I have not and do not plan to. And will make a case that it is either a good or a bad deal. It is certainly correct that not every deal is a good one, that you can make a bad deal, and, and we don't want to do that. However, the reason that presidents, Democrats and Republicans, and senators, Democrats and Republicans, the reason that many of our political authorities are interested in that kind of arrangement is they know, the economists tell them, in the long run, it's to our advantage to be in a big market. This nation has been incredibly prosperous and wealthy, partly because the Supreme Court very early, had, see lawyers do some good things. I, I guess the President Perrin is gone, but I'll say something nice about lawyers. Lawyers, uh, the, the Supreme Court early made a very good decision around the Interstate Commerce Clause that states can't restrict trade, which meant that Texas, Oklahoma, and Iowa can't put up trade barriers. It's really great. So that's, where I, that's how I think this works. And see where I've got political freedom happening? I put it there because there's some research that says that's where it goes. It comes after prosperity. And it doesn't have to be American-style democracy. Now, that's, that's where I'm going. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do some, I'm early here, while I hope you're still a little bit awake, uh, I'm gonna do some charts and graphs, and then we'll get to some stories, which I think you'll find easier to, to tolerate. Uh, several years ago, I've been doing projects with teams of graduate students in South Africa for more than a decade. And these are done in conjunction with a local organization, someone on the ground. Uh, our program, we made a decision very early, we do not do tours, we don't get in the bus and drive through. We want to get our students face to face working on a real problem with real locals. So that's what we do. Several years ago, an organization came to us and said, we'd like you to show us that, that a free press is essential to business success tourism, what have you. The organization that did this is a major South African media company. It happens to be located in Cape Town, and so it's particularly interested in tourism. What was going on was that the, Ameri the African National Congress was arguing internally a bill that they called the Protection of Information. Now, some of you would have enough political sensitivity to immediately be alerted by a name like that. You know, when politicians start protecting information, you wonder which information they're protecting. Uh, what, they wanted, what they wanted to do was to rein in the press that was revealing some of their corruption. And so it's more often called the secrecy law by locals. The debate was going on in the African National Congress. And, and African National Congress. South Africa remains a one-party state. All the real political decisions are made in the party and then revealed in the legislature. They aren't actually made in the legislature. So these folks were trying to intervene in the debate while it's still inside the party, and they needed intellectual ammunition. They're trying to protect the tourism industry in the Western, Western Cape, and they, were just, they weren't just answer, asking a question, they knew what answer they wanted. They needed, desperately needed, an answer that was yes. That's not the answer. They wished it were, was, and I'd have loved to have been able to say it was. These folks, this particular study, found in the literature a measurement of press freedom. You're gonna see that on the horizontal axis in just a minute. They found a measure of travel tourism competitiveness. That's gonna be on the vertical axis. And there's a chart. Over here on this, end, I'll put some, I, I, I've looked up a few, of the, a few of the actual countries. This may help you. There you go. So over on this end is freedom of the press, and that end is reduced freedom. You see our, our good friend North Korea is way over there. 
And vertically is this uh, uh, tourism index, uh, the environment that allows you to grow that industry, which almost every country would like to do. And you see Switzerland is right at the top and so on. We're doing, we're fairly good. We're in the upper cluster. You see some countries like Singapore and the United Arab Emirates that are wonderful places for tourism. Some of you have probably been there. Thriving tourism industry. They don't have freedom of press. You don't need it. The world is not as simple as I used to think it was, you know. Good, good things produce good people. Good people have good ideas. It's sort of like a comic book. Everything is perfect at the end. Stay with the same question, different study. These folks, and this is just about, this has just been out about a month. They're particularly interested in resource rich countries, which is particularly relevant to Southern Africa because a lot of those nations are rich in natural resources. And there's a large literature, which you're, some of your business faculty who teach in this area could describe in more length than I am going to try or even could, a large literature that talks about the curse of having these benefits, these, these uh, resources. Uh, it turns out that it's not a curse if you have good institutions. But for a long time, we talked about it and so it was. And they, once again, they're going to have a, a measure of economic freedom. And remember, I talked about that concept a few minutes ago. That's this freedom to do business. And they've got also a measure of total factor productivity. They take the GDP and combine it with a measure of real physical capital stock and the size of the labor force and so on. And there's, there's that result. Now, I can't make this any clearer. And I don't have access to the original. I've blown it up. I've tried everything I could. I can tell you where several specific countries are, and I've labeled some of them. Uh, here is that. Uh, over on this end, where I'm now standing, you have high economic freedom. Over there is low. At the top, we have growth. And this is over about a 30-year period. It's a long period. So it's averages. Uh, you see the United States, high in economic freedom, relatively positive in growth. We start at a very large base, so it's hard to, for us to show as much growth as some of the smaller economies. You can show a big percentage if you have a small base. There's our friend Hong Kong, Singapore, South Africa, lower left corner. Now that picks up a lot of the pre-apartheid time when they're still isolated from the rest of the world, which is why you see that. Uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia I've marked because those are the two parts of Rhodesia that are just basically northern parts of South Africa in, in a way. And you see where they are. Now that says that economic freedom produces growth. That's one of the arrows on my chart. Here's a couple quotations from them. The scatter diagram shows that freedom is positive related to growth. However, it's blurred in this case. The key contribution of this study is to identify the following three major elements of economic freedom that are most relevant for growth, especially in resource-rich developing countries. One, legal structure and security of property rights. Two, regulation. And three, freedom to trade internationally. Here's where they define those in more detail. I don't think we need to talk about that. I'm going to give you two quick slides here from a brand new, or I just found it. This is a dissertation done by a, uh, a, a woman in Zimbabwe. And I purchased this, purchased a copy of it while I was there this summer. Uh, when we talk about the legal situation, we sometimes look at a national average it's important to remember that the law is not applied equally to everyone. It, in many cases, still does not apply to men and women in precisely the same way. And, and as we've talked on a couple of occasions, sometimes by intent, it has not applied to people of different skin colors in our country and in others. In this particular case, this is, this is on a scale of uh, uh, one to five with uh, five meaning agree 
And so the, the high numbers are more positive. Uh, but you see there are still some things where, the, and these are all women. The respondent, I didn't say that clearly. All the respondents of this are urban entrepreneurs in Zimbabwe, female. So they're women in four, the four major cities of Zimbabwe. You can break that down by age, and you see that older women are a little more confident about their ability to do stuff than younger women, and that they are also a little uh, more concerned about it being, about being equally equal before the law. Now, I'm almost done with all this data. This is still a third study. Most agree that economic freedom includes secure property rights. At the same time, it's emphasized that the fulfillment of the postulate of economic freedom means the existence of a rule of law, which gets us over there to the need for a strong government. These folks have 20 years of data in the post-Soviet bloc countries. What they describe as a natural experiment all of a sudden, we've got more than 20 countries who set out to change two things. They set out to change their political system from an autocracy to a democracy, and they set out to change their economic system from socialism to capitalism. And what can we learn by working through the economic data? They've got, once again, a measure of economic freedom, a measure of political freedom. I've got a list of the countries there. The results did not give any basis to conclude that political freedom was a cause of economic growth. Absolutely no evidence in these countries for this period that political freedom produces growth or prosperity. Political freedom appeared to be neutral. Economic freedom, which has an impact on economic growth, in developed countries has the same impact in transition countries. Economic freedom helps everywhere. The results suggest that economic growth was a cause of political freedom. They actually spin through the sequence and come out with some structural equations that indicate they do not claim absolute causality. That's a deep metaphysical question. But the, the, but the, but the equations that suggest that if you look at those countries for that period of time, what you see is economic freedom, prosperity, political freedom in roughly that sequence. So there's my model. That's how I think it works. Let me talk to you about some people I've known in most cases. One of these I know only by reputation, but this man I know very well. Let me tell you about some people I know in southern Africa, people engaged in business, uh, people who I will describe as leaders, uh, and I say that with a, with a the mental note to myself that I tend to use that word leader more specifically than most people do, and I'll actually define it before we're done. This man is uh, Timitayo Odutayo. He lets most Westerners call him Tayo because it's a whole lot easier to say. He has a company he formed, Galaxy Express Tours and Logistics, and he also got involved at the bequest of some of my students in Halasa Innovation. This is a story that could be repeated many times in South Africa. This is a man who grew up in a township, in Lunga Township. This is a man who was able to uh, he's sort of a post-apartheid person. He came to maturity after apartheid. Uh, this is a man who got an education from a local technical college, studied computer information systems, it has a nice website. You can look up Galaxy Express. He has a nice website, partly because he has training there, and found it very hard to make a living. 
There just aren't jobs. There just aren't jobs. So he created a job. He formed a company. His name is Galaxy Express. It's a tourism country, company. He went through the training. Uh, the people I've taken there who've worked with Tayo sometimes ask me, how big is this company? How long have you known him? And the reality is this, as best I understand. He was very cagey about the size of the company when I met him. In retrospect, I'm pretty sure that what he had was a stack of business cards and the family car. That's what I think he had. Now, the last time I was there, he, he owns three cars and has some people working for him. And, and an office, he actually has an office with a chair and a desk. He was so proud. He, he took me to the office and got me a big, I really love grape appetizer. It's a, uh, it's, gra it's, it's grape juice, carbonated grape juice. It just, it's always wonderful stuff. And the red is my favorite. Uh, other people like the white and so on, but I like the red grape appetizer. And Tayo knows that about me, so he took me to his office, set me down in the chair, opened a big bottle of red grape appetizer and gave me a glass and just let me sit there until I drank the whole thing. Uh, but he knew that I would enjoy that and he wanted me to share some of that. So he started this company. And it's still been hard to make a living, but he's made a living. He moved out of the township. That's controversial for black South Africans. There are, of course, some there who insist you should stay here. There are people who do that. There's nothing wrong with it. He chose to move out. The reason he and Wikileaks moved out, he and his wife, they want their children in a good school. And they have managed to do that. They have managed to move north of Cape Town into the, on the edge of a really nice suburb. They're not really in it, but they're close enough that they're in the school and they've got their, they've got their uh, son and daughter in really fine school. And that's what drives him, is the future for my children. Now, he will take you to see the wildlife if you want to. This picture should never have been taken. This was to, I was not with them when they took this. You should never be that close to a baboon. No one who's any significant dealing with baboon has anything good to say about them. It is dangerous, but anyway, you know, I know that the guy who took this is alive. He survived. Tayo can show you baboons. He can show you the penguins. He can show you, he can take you to a township. And this is taken in a restaurant where they are training Disadvantaged, well, everybody in the township, in this particular township, is disadvantaged. They are training these people to, to work in a restaurant to serve food. And, and of course, you've got to have a live band, a live marimba band in South Africa. So, so we do. And, as I've just implied, but now I want to say explicitly, while Tayo has moved out of the township, he hasn't stopped going to the township. His tourism business, he takes people back, he takes all us rich white folks back, and, and, and rich black folks. He takes anybody who wants a tour, he takes you back to the township. Uh, the two women on the left are two of my students. The woman who's closest to me, uh, Nomagesi Sugar, is uh, a resident of Longa. When I met her, she was living in in a box, basically. Now, it was, a, it was a wooden box. It was basically a shipping container, but not, not a shipping container, but a, but a box built like a shipping container. And that's where she and her uh, aunt and mother were living. Uh, you would not have known that when you met her. She was neatly dressed. She is smart. She is a wonderful guide. And it was a couple years a couple of years after I'd worked with her that finally as we walked through one particular neighborhood of Longa, she said, this is where I live. Uh, Tayo comes back to Longa and hires people like Numagesi to work. Now, as I said to you, my students want to do projects. They're required to do projects. It's not an option for them. It's a requirement. 
So we had a group of students who decided that they would start a recycling center. And they needed somebody on the ground to run it. Now it is very difficult sitting in the United States, Washington DC or Lubbock, Texas, to find someone to run a recycling center in Cape Town. About the only contact we had was Timmy Tayo. So I said, if he's willing, I will attest to his character and to his energy. And he decided he'd try it. So he got training. In fact, I went through some of the training with him. It's, it's really fascinating how much people who do recycling know about paper and plastic and glass. Uh, and there's all sorts of jobs, I mean, at least in South Africa. In South Africa, there is a job of somebody who stands in the bin of, glasses, of, broke, of glass with boots and breaks it. You know, that's your job. Sort of like tromping cotton in the back of a cotton trailer, for those of us old enough to remember that that's how you harvested cotton once upon a time. Uh, but we needed, we needed to do this. We needed the support of the community center in Longa. We got it. Tayo got it for us. Then we scheduled training. This is, across the front there, uh, a number of different South African organizations. A paper product company that's interested in, SAPI is South African paper products. They're interested in recycling. There's a, there's a glass recycling, a plastic recycling, and all of that wonderful stuff there on the table is trash, where you're showing people what can be recycled because it's not immediately obvious to people what can be recycled. Uh, he got, we got training, Tayo let us arrange for that to happen. Tayo talked, it, talked the community center into making available a building. Now it, was, it wasn't being used, in fairness, there was nobody else who wanted it, it was just empty. But we got a building, we, got it, we cleaned it up, my students cleaned it up, I didn't. And the first thing you know, we had a recycling center operating in Longa Township. Now, that effort didn't survive. Most new ventures don't. In this particular case, it turned out that, that SAPI, uh, a very fine company, located within 10 miles of Longa Township, did not know the market. They, did not, they didn't know, did not know what was available in terms of recycled paper in Longa. It was the wrong township. And it was just right over there, and they didn't know it. Which is fairly typical of cultures that are divided along racial lines. So, there's a guy. That man's a friend of mine. He is a believer. He is raising, he would like for me to adopt his children as my grandchildren. I have so far resisted that because I know his Children are going to need a college education, and I'm not quite ready to take that on, but I might yet, who knows. Uh, Tracy Mutenhiri, I do not know her personally. She made the Washington Post front page in the last couple of weeks by doing something really, really extraordinary. She hired a white man. President of the country has sounded off that that doesn't sound like a good thing to do, but, but she did it. Now this is, we've crossed the Limpopo River into Zimbabwe, and this is a somewhat different story Zimbabwe at this point is maybe one of the saddest, it is one of the saddest cases in Africa, not as bad as it was a few years ago, one of the saddest cases in Africa. It is somewhat isolated, had the same kind of apartheid history as South Africa, we talked about this morning, both the Rhodesias did. They've coped with it less well, southern Rhodesia has coped with it less well than South Africa did. Sometimes I think the only good coming out of Zimbabwe is that it's given South Africa a model of what not to do. They really messed it up over and over again. It's not that they didn't try. 
there was a prime minister, a white man named Garfield Todd, who made every reasonable effort to turn that government toward a more inclusive policy. By the way, he was in Zimbabwe, then Southern Rhodesia, as a missionary from uh, Churches of Christ in New Zealand. A very impressive man. Uh, this is a statue at the Acre of Heroes. This is a huge monument area to celebrate the Civil War, the victors of the Civil War, uh, who were Mr. Uh, Mugabe's forces. Now it looks kind of odd to you and me, I suspect. Maybe it won't look quite as odd when I tell you it was designed in North Korea. I mean, when you're, when you're uh, Zimbabwe, sometimes you find your help in North Korea, and, and that's the statue. Uh, here, over to one side, is this uh, monument, and you, you see there the struggle depicted and this larger-than-life figure here at the right is, of course, Mr. Mugabe in glasses. He was, was a teacher at one point. Now, that's the National Seal. In fact, you saw it just a minute ago behind those statues. Uh, and if you look at that, you may wonder what all you're seeing. So if we were to take a closer look and knew exactly where to look, look at that, cotton bolts. And that's, in fact, cotton bolts. They grow cotton in the northern part of South Africa and, and in Zimbabwe. Now, back to this lady. She began her political career as a politician for Mr. Mugabe. She was eventually expelled from the party because she was not sufficiently obedient in voting for policies that they uh, supported. She then moved into the opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change, the MDC. Now let me get back to the farms. Zimbabwe, land possession is a huge problem across southern Africa and in other parts of the world, but it's particularly a problem there. As, as Desmond Tutu says, white men came, they brought the Bible, they said, let us pray, we joined them, and when we opened our eyes, they had the land, and we had the Bible. Uh, there is a sense that that's what, and there is some truth to that, that's not, that's not, just, not just something that someone's made up. Zimbabwe, instituted a policy of taking the land back from the white people who stole it. Now the white farmers mostly did not greet this with pleasure. Some of them said something like this, my grandfather farmed here, my parents farmed here, we've, we've got title, we've got clear title, look, here's the deed, we've been farming here for a long time, it's our land. But then you can at, then ask, where did that first white farmer get it? Did somebody sell it to him? And the answer is no, he came out here and took it because to him it looked like it wasn't being properly used. So they said, we're gonna take the land back. Uh, the international community said to Zimbabwe, uh, that would be fine. We encourage you to do this with a willing seller, willing buyer model. We're sure that there are a lot of white farmers in Zimbabwe that would be willing to sell for a fair price their farmland. And it would be highly appropriate for the government to facilitate that. You might even want to uh, support some of the purchasing. And Mr. Mugabe's government didn't do that. They have repeatedly let groups of war veterans simply come in and seize a piece of land. Uh, 
Six weeks ago, I'm sitting in a Jeep on the side of a road looking at what had been the most productive dairy farm in Zimbabwe. A country that used to export butter and cheese and milk and now imports butter and cheese and milk because there's no longer a dairy there. It has gone back to veld. It's, it's, it's waste. There is a small village where a family of, of Zimbabwe persons has taken up residence and they're doing some subsistence farming, but there's no dairy. And they're not making a very good living because they're not able. At the moment, they don't know how. They're perfectly able. They don't know how. This lady said, I know some people who know how. I'll go hire a guy. I'll go hire a, a guy who has run a farm. And I will say to him, help me grow tobacco. And after some fits and starts and complaints, she managed to get the government to approve that and has found a farmer and, and going back to work. There are many white farmers in Zimbabwe who are happy to do that. So, there's a person that I will mention to you. Shingai Ngara. He owns a company, Shingara Integrated Investments, and he has formed an NGO which he calls Zim Sunrise. Uh, I think I'm far enough from Zimbabwe to be fairly candid about this, so I will. But this is not what I would say if I were in South Africa. The Mugabe government can't last forever. He's in his 90s. Nobody really knows what will follow it, but there is a possibility that there will be a transition for good. In the meantime, Zimbabwe's had a huge brain drain. There are all sorts of talented, bright, well, Zimbabwe is a very well-educated country. So in South Africa, south of the Limpopo, the accountants and the engineers and the lawyers are often from Zimbabwe, also the cab drivers and the people serving food, but, but, but a huge influx of people. And Shingai is one of those. And he is saying at some point, the government will change. We need to be ready. Some of us might go home. If we don't go home, we at least can be fairly sure, we can at least hope that our native country will once again be welcomed into the community of nations, free trade will emerge, businesses will want to do business in Zimbabwe. Who better to represent them than an expatriate Zimbabwean? So let's get ready. So Zim Sunrise, is an organization just beginning, just really getting started with the hope that it can help the recovery of Zimbabwe. So what is, what is Shingai doing? Well, he's doing a couple of things. Uh, sometimes he prevails on friends of his, you see one of them over his left shoulder, he prevails on friends of his to bring U.S. students and do training sessions. So we did an event where in this, this is happening in Johannesburg in South Africa with mostly Zimbabwean expatriates where we are uh, providing some training on entrepreneurship and how to run a business. It's a, it's a, you, some of it's just what you'd see in any classroom with lots of discussion, uh, argument, uh, he, he provided lunch at a local restaurant. It was really nice. There are some of the students starting to talk. You, you, if you can, you get a, an, a retired, old, you know, a, a, a worn out old professor to come watch. You know, President Perrin said my title is Distinguished Professor. My younger sister says it should be Extinguished Professor. She may be right. Uh, 
and I co to coach some of the students. And, and, and then Shingai and I went into Zimbabwe, to Harare. And I did a workshop there, and I'm, re I'm reporting here officially, Mr. Provost, that I represented myself as, as affiliated with Lubbock Christian along with Georgetown. One more story, the most complicated, uh, the most inspiring, and the hardest one to tell. Uh, Mark Solms is a South African who has gone home to run a wine farm. Uh, you can look him up on the internet. If you're ever in the Cape Town, this is out at French Hook, uh, close to Stellenbosch, which is not too far from Cape Town. If you're ever in that part of South Africa, you should visit it. Uh, it is a fascinating story, and I will try to convey parts of it that I think I can that will be of, of, of interest to you. He left South Africa during the Angolan War. A lot, of men, a lot of men my age in South Africa are a little bit younger. Talk about their Angolan War as the equivalent to Vietnam here, as a war that was not popular, and a war in which many men tried to avoid, which is not necessarily evade, but tried to avoid serving in the military. They really didn't want any part of the war, didn't see any reason they should be fighting it. He's one of them. He went to the UK, got a doctorate, became a very successful professor, scientist, has done well, really done well. And then apartheid ends, and he has a chance to go home, and he says, I think I'll do that. He has some connection to some farming families in that part of the country, and he gets the help, some, uh, some, uh, some capital investment behind him, and they go back and buy a farm. Now his notion is that, in fact he would say this, I just want to fix one farm. I can't fix the country. I see that my country is a mess. I see what's gone wrong. I can't fix that. I want to fix this farm. I know nothing about farming, but I want to fix it. And surely the people working the farm know about farming. So I'll show up and say to them, it's going to be different now. And so he does that. He brings the people into his home. He says to them, I'm going to treat you differently. This is going to be better than it was. And you know what they do? Do you know what they say? This is what they say. They won't even talk to him. And he starts to realize that he has no real understanding of what generations of abuse do to people. And he starts looking at how the people who work on his farm live. They do not have indoor toilets. They do not have warm, warm water. For a bathroom, they have a trench. They have a very high incidence of alcoholism because for generations, the farmers there, the wine farmers, have realized that if you go ahead and pay your workers in product, you uh, tie them more tightly to the land. They will, he said, they would, he said, sit in a tree, just sit in a tree and look at you all day. Just sat there. He does not know what to do. Now, now the, one of the things that happens to him, he says, it starts to turn me into the farmer, which is not a positive comment there. The farmer in South Africa is an abusive, basically a plantation owner who doesn't technically own the people, but they come with the farm. And when he bought that land, he inherited this, these people. They are suddenly, they live here, they've lived here for generations, they work here, he's responsible. 
So he's got slaves. Uh, he doesn't really know what to do. So he decides he'll try to understand. He's got some medical training. He'll sort of do a medical history. How did we get here? He asks himself. Since he's affiliated, uh, this, is, this is the vineyard. This is part of the vineyard. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. When you go to, when you go to Stellenbosch and French Hook, you say, I understand why the Europeans stole it. I do not approve, but I understand why they did. And once they stole it, I understand why they wanted to keep it. It's, it's just beautiful. That doesn't fully convey it. Since he's affiliated with the university, he knows some anthropologists, some scientists. And he goes and he gets some people from the University of Cape Town and says, why don't you come do a study of the history of my farm? Just come study it. So they come out and they literally dig trenches, some of which are still there. They dig trenches. They find old stone tools. They find just a variety of stuff. Now, in the midst of all this, he did have one worker, a foreman, who became foreman, who seemed to sort of get it and would try to work with him. And there are, uh, the neighbors keep cutting down his trees and he cannot figure out why. And he will say to this man, why do they do that? And this man will say to him as though it's an answer, they're Bushmen. They're Bushmen, as though that explains it. Mark actually plants new trees and offers to cut the wood. So these people will have firewood rather than cut down his treasured trees. Doesn't do a bit of good. And he says, why? And he says, they're Bushmen. Now that same guy who is implying in what I've just quoted that he's not Bushmen, right? They're Bushmen. The archaeologists come up with some, some flint tools, some stone tools. And they are, they've assembled the workmen and they're showing them. And this same guy turns to Mark and says, see, Mark, my people were here before yours. Well, they, of course, were Bushmen. So he is Bushmen. He's just uncomfortable with that at this point. Now, there, this is a historian who now is the curator of the library at his wine farm. She does a wonderful job. They have a marvelous, marvelous history of that one piece of land. All sorts of things, well, a couple things that they did not expect and that turned out to be rather scandalous. You see, the understanding out there, I mean, this after all is Stellenbosch. This is a part of South Africa where we have for generations pretended we were still in Europe. There are places where you'd think you were in Switzerland from the architecture. So we are white folks and there are the Bushmen and the black folks. Well, you start digging through the history of some of those family farms and you get back to a point where white male settlers don't have any white women with them and they fall in love with a woman who's one of their slaves or workers, it turns out that a lot of those families are mixed. Mark's neighbors did not welcome this news. Uh, they, they found this disturbing. What are you saying about us? very nice museum and since it's South Africa and it's a vineyard you're going to have music. When he got there there was one old drunk I think they called him George I don't remember for sure who he thought was useless but he began to sort of do things better and Somebody got the old man a guitar, and it turns out he could play, and play pretty well. And the first thing you know, it turns out a lot of people on that farm have a good deal of musical talent and want to perform. And now they sing and play and travel and provide training. 
Uh, and so you'll have someone who will play, and you'll have some singing, and you'll have dancing. It'll be fun. It is fun. Now, I haven't told you what's going on behind the scenes. Not everyone could do what Mark has done. He is successful already, and he got some financial help to do this, but this is what he did. They bought a farm. They made the ownership a trust with shares. And he owns, I think at this point, a third. The workers own a third, and the silent investors own a third. The workers suddenly own part of the farm. That's never been done. That upset his neighbors. That really upset his neighbors. But the people I take there often say to me, this is like a different world. These people are happy. And indeed they are. I mean, they are, they are happy. They aren't performing just because they need to perform. They are happy. It's their farm. And we're customers. And they're delighted for us to be customers and to show us the museum and to, and to, to send cases of wine home with students. It, it's lovely. And they'll sell us shirts and they'll sell us hats. And you, you, get the, you get the idea. Mark has yet to take any money out of the farm. He's just left all of his in. It's going back into reinvestment and growing. Um, so, I started by asking, or at least implying the question, how can we contribute to prosperity, seeing that as something that can lead to justice and peace? Well, one thing you can do is take a job or start a business that uses your God-given talents and do the job or run the business well, like Timmy Tayo. That may sound simplistic, I believe it's true. Men and women who choose careers in business, and also many other careers, but I'm talking about business careers. Men and women who choose business careers and do them well, advance the well-being of their communities, they make life better for themselves and the people they employ and the people from whom they buy things, and all of that helps the community think more about what's fair. What do we need to do for folks? I don't have an example of this, but I would say support strong uh, government and economic freedom. That, that helps. Number three, embrace change in your business and in your personal life. Face up to reality, like Timmy Tayo or, or uh, Tracy. Tayo has made at least two different career changes already, and he's still a relatively young man. He has created a successful tourism business, and then when he thought he had a chance to do something maybe better, tried that. That didn't work out, so he's back to tourism. In both of those, he has wanted to conduct them in such a way not only as to be successful and make money for himself and keep himself in his nice house and his children in a nice school, but also benefit the people who live in Langra, the people he grew up with. And Tracy, I am so impressed. Now she is not, by some standards, a good person. You can read about her on the internet. She's accused of breaking up a marriage, and, and uh, one of her daughters is a real socialite. She's, but as a person who is facing up to what needs to happen in Zimbabwe, my, she is right. Whatever you and I may think about the land seizure, it's happened and it's going to stay there. And one can argue that it's the right thing. I, I don't want to get into that, but, but you can argue that it is the right thing. I mean, I sometimes, when I'm talking about this, think, how would I feel if the Comanches wanted my family farm back? I would not like it, 
but but and it is in a, in a way the same issue. It, it it the little distance in time, but it's the same issue. Uh, she is saying, "This is where we are. I need help. That man's white. He can help. I should hire him." And the man is saying, "Yes, give me a job." Now. President Mugabe is quoted in responding to that by saying, we don't want to have to refight the revolution. We don't want to give the farms back to the white people. Well, he's a, he may be the most racist person left in that country. I think he's simply mistaken about that. She is right to say, we have a problem, we should face it, this is, this is one way to do it. How to contribute to prosperity? In support in others. Support, invest in others. Shanghai is looking ahead a decade, two decades, and he is trying to help both expatriate Zimbabweans and Zimbabweans to prepare themselves to function in a new economy. We did a workshop on entrepreneurship in Hariri. We had people there who were trying to figure out how to start a I mean, the economy is in bad shape, and so people are looking for any way to make a living. It was a very fruitful discussion. I, I've told some of the faculty, I think I was politically circumspect. I tried to be. Uh, my wife was frightened about what I might say. I tend sometimes to, she believes that sometimes I am overly frank. So after this was all over, uh, Shingai said to me, you know the guy in the red shirt who was sitting back there? And I said, yeah. So that, that's President Mugabe's nephew. Uh, and I, I don't think I said anything that'll have Mr. Mugabe's police coming after me. This man is a Zimbabwean citizen who is investing in his fellow citizens. Um, and he has that posture because he's successful in business. And you can practice justice and peace in your work life like Mark. He is transforming a part of the wine industry in South Africa. So there's my list of suggestions, students, on how to contribute to prosperity, which I believe contributes to justice and peace. Now, I'm not going to get deeply into this because I can't do it, I cannot do this this quickly. Uh, I, my, as I've said to a number of you, I think a lot of the discussion about leadership is inspirational rather than really very helpful. It's helpful as inspirational. It's not an academic analysis of what leadership is. Uh, this is a definition I use. It's based on uh, work by Nathan Harder, who is coming out of the American uh, pragmatists, Dewey and uh, uh, Peirce and uh, uh, George Herbert Mead. And the theory that I use then that I find most helpful is uh, social identity theory, which is one of the major theories of social psychology that, that has to do with how we start with the basic assumption that you and I go around sorting out <coughs> me and you, us and them, we and they, and that, uh, that the, pro the leadership emergent process comes out of that. Uh, so this, this is, may, is, I hope it doesn't look simplistic, but that's the definition I use. So when I talk about these people, I didn't pick them because they were successful business people. One can say that they are, and in some cases, spectacularly successful. I picked them for the following reason, that in every case, I can tell you, people are voluntarily following them. They're not being forced. They're not being paid. They're not being ordered. They are looking at that person and saying, I want to help with that. I want to be, there are people in Longa who want to be like Tayo. They want to be like him. They want to get out of the township. There are people, uh, I hope, a few so far, I hope a lot of people in Zimbabwe will follow Tracy and say, I'm gonna hire a white farmer. That's not a bad idea. I don't really care what color the farmer is. It happens right now. The most experienced and knowledgeable farmers in Zimbabwe happen to be white. I'm going to hire one of them. A lot of people, I mean, Shingai is trying to build an NGO from the ground up, starting from nothing. And so he's now had two successful events. He paid for most of it. I paid for my part. 
And, and, and you see this community gathering around him, saying, huh, oh, this man's gonna solve problems. I wanna be part of it. And the really nice thing about Mark's, Mark Psalms, some of the farmers around him have started coming to him quietly and saying, could you talk to us about how you're doing this? Uh, maybe we should be doing something like that. Uh, and indeed they should. I think I've got a couple minutes for questions if there are any. We won't do too many. We'll save most of those. No, it's time for me to quit, isn't it? Well, then I'll just skip to my last slide. The one question that none of you are going to ask me, but that I thought some of you might like to know the answer, it is this. Yes, baby rhinos are cute. <laughs> they are. That's a, that's a black rhino, one of the rarest. Uh, it is the rarer of the two major forms. And yes, they're cute. And they make a little, they make noises, you know, like they sound like a little baby. Yeah. All right. Thank you.